bilingual humanitarian journalist, a voiceover artist, and a dedicated spoken word poet. The Nigerian Zambian humanitarian has worked with thousands of survivors of the Northeast insurgency as a program's personnel on projects funded by various international donors, such as UNICEF, NHF, European Union, UN Women, Spotlight Initiative, and many more in Nigeria. SNET is a strong advocate against all forms of gender-based violence, stigma of marginalized populations, and has facilitated hundreds of empowerment, psychosocial support, and life skill trainings and sessions across Nigeria for over a decade. SNET is currently a social development consultant for nonprofit organizations and the founder of the budding Voice by Estet voiceover. She is happily married and is a mother of a beautiful baby girl. Michael Mackinde is a logistics and supply chain professional with over 25 years of experience. He is reputed for implementing strategies that have improved the global transportation system on domestic and international freight through practical reforms in the inventory management process. In his about three decades leading different segments within the supply value chain, he has provided cost-effective strategies that have scaled revenue and cost reduction. Mackinde currently works as the logistics and distribution manager for Frigo Glass, a leading manufacturer in commercial refrigeration and West Africa's leading glass producer. The company has operations in many countries across Europe, Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. In this capacity, he provides leadership for the company's inbound, outbound, and local distribution activities and ensures global trade management compliance in export and import documentation. He is also responsible for implementing logistics service provider evaluation standards and reporting. In this capacity, he has achieved 95% actual inbound delivery against forecast, 100% local distribution plan, excellent contact management, and realized 15% reduction in cost of 3PL during contract review. He is also reputed for his cost saving strategies, which has saved the company an average of 83.7 million naira annually in demorage following his introduction of fast track and pre-release. He has also saved the company to the tune of 15 million euros as a result of the reforms he introduced, which has led to efficiency in the logistic bottlenecks and resulted in faster, more accurate supply shipments. Makinde has previously worked as a logistics manager for Wholesale Trading Company Limited, Abuja, as a logistics manager. In this role, he managed the execution of all import and export activities and worked with other team members to establish and maintain effective export and import activities in relation to the organization's sales, purchasing, materials management, production, and overall operating functions. He also ensured realistic contract management with vendors and transporters at all levels, achieved 90% on all insurance claims and 60% savings in the delivery lead time, from an average of 15 days to 7 days. He was previously engaged with Nigeria Distilleries Limited, where he managed and executed procurement-related functions, implemented contract management and procurement frameworks, sourced strategies, negotiated agreements, reviewed and evaluated purchasing status daily, weekly, and monthly in order to achieve company aims. He also managed raw materials planning and ensured the conversion of commercial sales forecast to production materials requirements. In this role, he achieved 100% vendor management, 99.5% average delivery rate on all assignments with no loss of materials or assets, and consistently worked with the team to exceed stated objectives on International Standards Organization ISO projects. Makinde has a strong academic pedigree. He has at different times attended the Owners Management Program OMP, at the Lagos Business School and also backed the Advanced Certification in Supply Chain Management, also from the Lagos Business School. He is a Certified International Trade Logistics Specialist, CITLS, from the International Import-Export Institute, Arizona, USA. In 2006, he became a Certified Exporter, a certification he backed from the International Import-Export Institute, Arizona, USA. In 2008, he became an Associate of the Institute of Corporate Affairs Management, AICA. He is also a chartered member, Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport, United Kingdom, 
and a member of the Institute of Purchasing and Supply, United Kingdom. He is a member of the Nigerian Association of Chambers of Commerce, Industry, Mines and Agriculture, member Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Makindei has previously served as the Vice President of the OMP 33 alumni of the Lagos Business School. He has at different times served as the Treasurer and Vice Chairman of the Manufacturer Association of Nigeria, Non-Metallic Section. Makindei believes that Nigeria has the capacity to translate its land, geography, demography, and huge market to become a global leader in the logistics value chain. If properly harnessed, he believes that the sector has a strong potential for growth and can serve as a path to building a strong economy that can support government revenue and improve Nigeria's foreign exchange earnings. Amazing. Like our, our panelists are amazing. You've seen their profiles. This is, wow. So before we go on, I would like to re-emphasize that today we're going to be talking about thriving against all odds beyond limits. And we're going to begin with the panel session. Just introduce some of our panelists. Also, um, our coach, Coach Dominion, will be joining the panel session as well. So we will go right into it shortly. To our panelists, you very much welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for agreeing to share from your world of experience and give us so much insights on what we're discussing today. So um, I will begin with Mr. Michael, because I think uh, we can do that. So first, uh, first question to you, Mr. Michael, is as a professional with over 30 years experience working in supply chain and logistics, what has been the greatest challenge you have faced and how have you been able to overcome it and come out successful? Okay, we can hear you. You need to unmute, sir. You're muted. Yeah, thank you very much. I am impressed. Uh, and I also appreciate the organizer of this uh, uh, web webinar. You have done so much. I appreciate you. Um, Having been in this uh, industry for almost 30 years, I have been able to face a lot of uh, challenges. I've seen so many things out of which I am willing to share out of my experiences to you. Okay. Yeah, I what I can say as a major challenge, which I have uh, I encountered in my in the history of my career is when I lost a job. This job, I got a job in Abuja and uh, it was a very, very good job. I was given an official car. I had a secretary. I had a very good and a awesome uh, package while working there. So uh, at a point, the, the, I lost that job, not because I was not competent, but there was a policy by federal government that affected everybody. So uh, our chairman who was, uh, who was then an executive uh, director of the bank was involved in a lot of uh, issues that affected the business. So I lost that job. And I was striving hard to get another job. It, it was really, really, really uh, a painful experience in my life. So I tried to do all that I could do, talking to my friends. Let me also tell you this. I was not lazy. I, I had a Jeep and that Jeep, I used to help a friend of mine who was into aluminum, construction of aluminum, a lot of things like that, to carry aluminum from um, Kubo area to wherever it needs to work. So, 
the guy was giving me money, to be honest, 5,000, 7,000, like that. That was what I was using to manage myself. So I, the day I thought within me that this Jeep, I need to sell this Jeep and start a business of my own. So that very day, when I was, when I was going for uh, an icon, the Jeep involved in an accident and it was a write-off. Oh. To be honest with you, I, I, I suffered because the guy who actually hit my car is an, uh, an Ausa guy, he can speak Ausa very well. We went to, uh, to police station and because I couldn't speak Ausa language, you know, the guy was, <laughs> they said, I should go and repair, repair the guy's car. I didn't have money. Okay. So I have, to, I have to do it actually. And uh, when I got home that very night, I, I wept. This was uh, the first time in my life that I have ever weep. I don't weep no matter what happened, but that night I wept. So I actually threw myself into, you know, praying and fasting. And uh, I bought a book. The book, the title of that book named uh, uh, um, the title of that, that book was uh, The Prayer of Jabez. And I was praying along with that book. So at a point, to the glory of God, I, I got an offer in a multinational company. And uh, from there, I made up my mind that the mistake I made in the past, I will never make such mistake. So if you are asking me my, the, my bitter experience in life was when I lost my job and I became an irresponsible fellow. You know, when you lose your job, a lot of things will follow. Yeah. Yeah, you, you won't know what to do. You'll be confused. You'll be able to cater for your family. A lot of things that follow it. So this, this was my greater you know, experience in life during my career. Well, it, it definitely was an experience. Me just hearing it is like, wow, that's a lot. And your capacity and your tenacity to go beyond that is what, is what has brought you here today. And it's really inspiring. Thank you so much for sharing that story. Next, next up is Mrs. Kolade. And as a mother, as an entrepreneur, as a woman, there are many, many, so many things that really just try and like arrows at us. And we know it's true. So the question to you is, how are you able to maintain resilience and motivation when facing different situations? Even if you're so difficult, you know, as a woman, how do you maintain that resilience and tenacity? Okay, first of all, <laughs> you're juggling a lot as a woman. And as you can see, like, oh, here, I have my little one here and I have a Zoom meeting and I'm going to do this. So you just have to keep at it. You just have to keep at it. You plan your schedule that, okay, young lady, I'm going to put you to sleep. And I'm going to wake you up at this time so that you will sleep during my Zoom meeting. But alas, <laughs> there are some things that are out of your control and you just have mm -hmm. to make it work. And that is, this is a practical example for me here right now. Um, you said as a woman, I grew up in, uh, my, uh, my father has two wives. And the major reason why he, um, he, went into the second marriage was because he was looking for a son. My mom had four, four daughters. And of course, long story short, they separated. And I found myself in a different country and life was extremely difficult. Life was extremely difficult. So resilience for me didn't start with becoming a mother. It was just another avenue to express. Motherhood is another avenue to express resilience. Um, her being a being a wife is another avenue to express resilience in its way. So resilience comes in different forms. And I remember um, while I was struggling 
then it was very difficult to raise my school fees. And my mom insisted on taking me to a private school. And I didn't, for the life of me, I didn't understand why she would do that yeah. because I knew we were struggling financially. Okay. But she saw the bigger picture and she was like, no, I'm going to invest in your education. And she would have me reading a lot of books. So it was cheap to go to the, to the library then. So she would get me books. I would go, I remember reading a book called The Thornbirds. It had over a thousand pages. And that was like in my late primary school. And I, this, it just helped me develop vocabulary. And I remember I was constantly, they had this particular teacher that was constantly chasing students out who had not paid their school fees. And I remember I would hide. And one of the places that I was really fond of, they ended up catching me, but I was really fond of hiding there was the toilet. So I would stand on top of the toilet seat so that the teacher, that when the teacher is passing by, they won't see my, my legs. And I remember I was standing on that toilet seat and I was like, God, I am tired of this. And I, I want a better life for myself. My mom is struggling, but I see where she's trying to get me to, but I, I want to be something and I don't want to ever have to struggle financially. I don't ever want to have to struggle with my needs this embarrassment. They literally knew me at a point. I was brilliant. I was good in sports. But because I, I could not afford my school fees, they also kind of tagged me as the girl that could not pay her school fees. And that enveloped my brilliance. It, 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 it covered how good I was in sports. But because I wanted to be better, I continued at it. I continued. And to God be the glory, I was, you know, God just helped me. I found my way back to Nigeria and I now got into a job where, cause I, I'm a bit daring because of that incident, God was able to raise my school fees. He raised people that would pay for me. Like, so I was given a, a scholarship. So that's how he came through. And I was like, okay, if God can see me through this, then he can see me through other things. And I got a job in Northeast Nigeria. And my father told me, Esnet, if you go there, I will disown you. But I was sure of one thing. I was sure of my passion. I was sure of the impact I wanted to make. I was sure that I needed to, if it meant that I had to go in some places that were not safe to be able to achieve what I wanted, I had to dare. And I went to the Northeast and from that experience there, of course, God saw me through. I saw people that have been through so much. You know what's going on in Northeast Nigeria right now? So many people are dying because of the unrest and all of that. I saw women and children that have experienced terrible things, but wake up each morning and are striving to do better. That fueled me. As a mother, now, yeah. as a wife, uh, you understand? There's a different ball yes, game inspired me. There, I'm in my own space. I can make my own decisions. And then now I have to look to the other side and say, okay, <laughs> I have to share sure. this idea with someone and of course being a mother as well I'm accountable for a human being who depends on me I want to sleep but she's looking at me like I'm not sleeping anywhere you must breastfeed me <laughs> wow. you must take care of me so it's it's really just resilience number one resilience didn't start here resilience yeah. in different oh, forms allow it to so yes that's how it has been for me. If you allow resilience to come in, it will come in different forms. You just have to take that bold step. Very important. Take that bold step. Thank you very much. For everyone listening in, this is, these are real people, real stories. So you're not manufactured things. These are things that surely life has its challenges and we cannot avoid it. But what do we do with those challenges and how do we move forward and get better and improve ourselves? Next up is our own coach. And uh, the question to you, coach, is as a professional and even as a woman, as a top management executive, what are the calculated risks you have taken? And how have this risk paid off for you? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, let me first acknowledge my co-panelists, Mr. Michael. Thank Mrs. you. Mrs. Kolade, 
the, these are amazing stories. Now we've seen that SNET has stylishly switched <laughs> off our camera. We are intentionally <laughs> keeping this real so that we can all connect with it, striving against all odds. And I want to answer my question, but I, I just wanted to celebrate the panelists and um, bring it home for the listeners. This month, we are really very passionate about it. It's the International Women's Month. You know, we women, now you give us an inch. <laughs> we take it, now you give us one day, we took the month. Yeah, and we looked at it. What should we do on read? that is most appropriate for this, especially in this time that we are in. We have people that are logging in from different parts of the world. Striving against all hordes is not a Nigerian problem. Yes, Catherine, Catherine from Uganda, I said, deep inspiring story. Ashanti Shana, so that's, um, I hope I pronounced it well and I didn't mother the longer local lingua over there in Uganda. So th this is real, you know, the first time I heard Mr. Michael's story, and please, this is really, really important. We are all here, we're all different. We really don't know what you might be going through at this point in time, but we just believe that the stories would resonate somehow, somewhere with you. Not just in Nigeria, and I find it interesting to see that the last time I checked the statistics, Nigeria was not among the top 10 countries that were committing suicide. So mental health is real. You know, when I heard Mr. Michael's story, I was like, God, how did you cope? You lost your job. Then the car that you were using to like try to sustain life, that car becomes a write-off. And when a full grown man is telling you in front of camera that he wept, it is not a small matter. It yeah. is not a small matter at all. We've heard SNX story. Some of these things sound like, oh, it is motivational, aspire to perspire. And that's why we decided to make it real and bring it home. That see, truly, the downfall of a man is never the end of his life. The, whatever you're going through today, I've heard stories, there were some I knew personally of young men in their mid thirties, some in their late twenties committing suicide for what? What is it that is happening to you that has not happened to the life? It's also that the story will be sweet now. Please pick a drop link, send us your stories. We'll, we'll feature you so that you can inspire somebody else. Whatever you're going through right now is an inspiration for the next generation. Trust me, go through it. If, if you had read Mr. Michael's story, you know, I think that's the problem with profiles. When we read the profiles, when, if you read Mr. Michael's profile, you read SNS profile, the profiles do not tell the stories. So you think that great men were born great. That's right. Greatness that's right. is a process. Mm -hmm. And please keep at this stay at it. Okay, so thank you. You know me now, I will talk. <laughs> now, um, you do not disappoint at all. So over to the question, coach. <laughs> yeah, so now to my question, what is the greatest risk I've um, taken yes. in the course of my career? Mm, interesting. Every day truly is a risk, truly. I mean, getting out of your bed, you are taking a chance and... I think daily I take risk, but the question is, what is the greatest risk I've taken? And I th think looking back at my life, the greatest risk I've taken is actually having the boldness to create this platform, read community. When I got the vision to create read community, people find it difficult, like, Lots of people feel like I'm just talking. <laughs> you, you'll be so, Doctor. Yet today, and I were in school together. You'll be hearing her talk. Amazing woman doing amazing things. Same thing with Doctor Tolu. So, Doctor, to, um, sorry, Captain Tolu, Captain Tolu, myself, Doctor. Yet today, we're all in school together at the same time. And yes, I'm answering my question. Of, I'm reminding you of principle, guys. That's why I'm telling you, you cannot be hanging out with Mumu Mumu people. <laughs> your company will determine your altitude. You need to be deliberate and strategic about your company. So these are great women 
I've known for over 20 years now, and they are still doing great, amazing things. And we're actually plenty in that company. You guys have met Dr. Tayo Ideji, and those are the things I'm talking about. So me in school, I'm bringing this home. Me in school, I'm sure Dr. Itunde cannot correlate the Itunu in school with the Itunu she's saying now. When I got the vision for read, I'm like, I don't like to talk. I don't like to be in people's faces. I like to do my things from the background on saying, I don't like it when everybody knows me. So it was a big risk. There was that fear of what will people say? How would you even get this right? Would you be able to connect with people? Who is going to listen to you? Month in, month out, you know? All those fears were there and they were real. And I had to confront my fears. I had to look at my biggest fears in the face. What is the worst thing that can happen? I call Okay. I think we're having a bit of a network challenge with Coach. Can you hear me? Or is it just me? We can hear you. Okay, so I think we lost the uh, connection we have for a bit. So once we can gain connection, so she go right on Mina, to- And nobody shows up. Right now we're having webinars with- Okay, so I've changed internet Welcome source. Back. I've changed internet source. Okay, is it better great. now? Yes, much better. Is it better, better now? Okay, okay. Yeah, so where did you lose me? Where did you lose me? Okay, you're talking about uh, your personality in school and just going oh. that and just pushing okay. you to listen up read right now. Okay, yeah, so I was saying my personality is, I'm an introvert. People find that very difficult to believe right now. And I'll tell you, that's why I can safely tell you, you can be anything. Honestly, you can learn anything. I'm an introvert. I'd rather sit down indoors, reading my books and all of that. And I have this vision to start a global community. It was like, who is going to do it? How will I stand in front of people month in, month out? How am I going to put my face on flyer? Like the first time I saw my face on the flyer, I freaked out. I didn't want to share it. Everybody's going to be looking at me. And oh, yeah. I've um, confronted that fear. The good news is right now in Read, we have thousands of views. We are in over 10 countries, spread over four continents, and we are still waxing strong. The kind of people I met on, I've met through Read, I could never have met them in the corner of my room that I wanted to hide in. So if you ask me what is the greatest fear I've done in my professional career, this is it, forming the Read community. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Coach. It, in fact, just hearing this, I'm kind of like thinking back, reflecting back on myself, and I'm wondering if Reed wasn't formed, a lot of things would have gone wrong. Because I'm a very, I'm a number one beneficiary of this platform, and over two thousand people have gone or is going through Read the process, and we're learning, and we're being coached and being mentored, and you're reaching out to people all over the globe, ten countries now, and counting. So you're doing amazing work. Thank you for taking that that pain off in humanity. Thank you so much. Uh, for our listeners and everyone part of this webinar, please um, in the comments, in the chat box, drop a comment. How much has this story been inspiring you? If you have questions as well, you can, for any of the panelists, please, you can drop it in the comment section as well. Okay, so we're moving on, moving on quickly because we are running out of time. Mr. Michael, I have another question for you. And this time around, it's a lot of people are like, okay, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to succeed. I want to do better in my career. But what would you say, what advice would you give your younger self? So if you were faced with your 30-year-old self, what advice would you give him? Can you unmute yourself, sir? Yes. Thank All right. you. Thank you very much for the question. And uh, yes, for the for those who are just coming up right now, I would like to advise them to number one, stop.
stop being caring about what other people think about you. Mm. Push in our in our message. Number two, be confident in you. Number three, must understand that friends will come and they will go. It will remain oh. yourself. Then four, let as in learn to let things go. If you are putting things in your mind or in your hand, you will hardly succeed. Mm -hmm. okay. It's not possible to let things go. Then, lastly, before I tell you past my personal, you know, story regarding this question, it is never too late to make a change. Mm -hmm. So. Please take note of that. Now, let us quickly tell you a story, a life story about myself. I wasn't born with a slave spoon in my mouth. I, my, my parents are not rich. And I can tell you for free that all my education, right from after secondary school till now, was self-sponsored. Nobody sponsored me. Wow. Wow. As a matter of fact, I left my parents. Mr. Michael, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Please, can somebody <laughs> pin that? No, because I keep hearing this. The reason why I'm where I am is because I have nobody to train me. Please. Yeah. Yeah. Did you hear? No, no, no. I just had to. That is. Thank you, sir. I had to just shout it on the rooftop. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> you're, you're, you're welcome, man. You, you see, I it was what I'm telling you is a life story of me of myself. Nobody financed my education. I, as a matter of fact, I left my parents when I was in SS2, not even SS3. And what made me to leave my parents was that I have a friend, a very close friend of mine, who's uh his father was no more as at that time. So we were using their city room. That was where we were sleeping. We are about four, four of us. So I lobbied to seek for my WAEC school uh, exam uh, fee. And I did it. And that was the beginning of the wow. journey. It wasn't pleasant, I must tell you. That is why I said today, if I see so many people who always say, eh, I don't have money, that's why I didn't go to school. I felt bad because it, it, that wasn't my own story. Yeah. A, lady, a lady told me that, Mike, will you be able to work in Nordstrom Primary School? I said, what am I waiting for? I will work, I will, I will do it. Yeah. So I, I, I started working. My first work in life was in Nordstrom Primary School. I was, I remember then I was earning 1,100 Naira. The, okay. yeah. I hope we heard that, Jack. Okay. 100 Naira on top of that 1,000 Naira, you know, was the proprietor said she would be saving it for us. During Christmas time, we will get it. So what we were earning then, was just 1,000 Naira per month. I'm sorry if I will take a little bit, a little bit of your time here, but please pardon me. Okay. Um, my first, <laughs> what I ever bought in my life, all my first asset that I ever bought in my life was a, a tape, you know, that tape that you put cassette and play. That was what I used my money to buy. <laughs> and, you know, the same lady told me, ah, Mike, you can't just end your career here. Why don't you go to uh, uh, Polytechnic and have your national diploma? No, she, she advised that I should go for uh, NCE. I said, no, I don't want to go for NCE. She advised that, okay, you can go for uh, ND as a part-time. Can you just imagine my school fees at that time was 17,000 uh, Naira, and I was earning 1,000 1, Naira per month. How would I be able to pay 
17,000 naira per semester. But I, 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 I started and I was doing it. It wasn't pleasant. I couldn't buy complete handouts. So I managed, you know, to finish my ND with uh, uh, upper, uh, uh, what well, are they going <laughs> Um, oh. this is a class of power or something. So that is how I finished my national diploma then. And I did not stop there. I have to move to, uh, I went to uh, the university on direct entry, the same uh, part-time program. So now after that, I got a job somewhere else. That was where I started my logistics and supply chain career. So I moved, I started working and I was going to school. It wasn't, it wasn't a pleasant one. Let me just give you this joke. It was a light joke. A woman that we were living together, that we were living together in the same face-to-face -face, gave me a a shirt, this shirt. When I didn't have a shirt to wear to school, she gave me that shirt. And um, I went to school that day. I was feeling good. I was okay. What coming from school that day? The woman's daughter met me on the road and embarrassed me by saying, This is my mother's shirt. You stole my mother's shirt off it. You know, I, I felt bad. I <laughs> felt bad. Yes, and I have no choice than to, you know, off that T-shirt and give to her on the main road. Of course, when the when the woman came back from work, she was so annoyed, and she was even asking me, "Why did I off it?" You know, these are part of the stories. Mm. So, mm. And, and along the line. I had passion for studying at Obafemi Aolowo University. So because of financial constraint, I couldn't go to that school. But after finishing my uh, first degree, uh, I had the second class upper in accounting. After finishing my first degree, I decided in me that this school that I could not afford that time, I must go there. That was where I finished my master's degree. And wow. it's, yes, yeah. I, I felt fulfilled. Yeah, it, sure. You know, without anybody sponsoring me. So I, I, after after that, I you know I was working and you know my boss then was a Muslim. You know, those people who did not go to school, but uh, they were opportune to be in a bigger position. And when they see you rising, they keep, you know, suppress you. They don't want you to go ahead of them. That was a day. The man told me, Michael, look at this table. He was pointing to his table in his office that this table, you cannot get there. Even, even when I resigned and I leave this organization, they will not put you here. And I told him, this is where the issue of being confident in yourself coming. I said, sir, I never aimed at your table. I am aiming higher than this table. Okay. Yes. And it wasn't long after that. Because the man was like, okay, whatever it is, it will not allow me to pass. It wasn't long after that, that God just did it for me. I got a wow. job in At that time, I was even chasing, you know, uh, assistant manager, assistant manager's uh, position. But as the Lord will do it, I got an offer for a full managerial post in oh, Abuja. Okay. This with, is amazing. Of, you know, with fantastic offer. Uh, 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 what do you call it? Offer. And, I mean, and so it's, I need to let you know, uh, all the younger ones that are coming, 
that no matter what God plans for you, be focused, be dedicated, and don't be distracted by anything. That's why I mentioned that don't you should stop caring about what other people think about you. When I was going to school, people thought I would never make it in life. People were looking at me because I am a second or third class citizen or student in our class. Yeah, I didn't buy a house, I didn't buy anything, but here I am today. I thank God, I am better than most of them. Let me just stop here because of our time. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sure we could have a special webinar dedicated to user on another day, but we'll have to move on so that we can accommodate. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your stories. Inspiring. I'm seeing the chat box. People are just like be focused, really reiterating what you're saying, and they're really inspired. Thank you so much. And before we round off this session, because we're really pressed for time, the last question, um, Mrs. Essenet, it would be a brief one, but just something very short. I would want you to talk about or share a particular story, very short, because we are really pressed for time, how you handled failure, because people are afraid of failure. But it's a reality that we have, we are faced with every day of our lives. So a particular story of how you faced failure and how you were able to overcome it and even change it to success. Are you there? Okay, I think uh, her network is having. Can you hear me? Oh yeah, yes, of course we can hear you. We can hear you, but your video is a bit. I think it's frozen. Are you still there? Yes, I am. I can hear. Okay, you can go ahead, please. I hear you very clearly. Okay, go ahead, please. Okay, I think we're having a bit of a challenge. I don't know if you can. Oh, yes. Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, if this is. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you go oh. ahead, please? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I can hear you clearly. Please go ahead. Thank you. Okay, so <laughs> I mean, failure is, I think, okay, I think we're having a bit of a challenge with her network. At sometimes it's inevitable. You can't, um, those of us that have failed, you know, only encourage us us to move and be better is that I'm um, apart from being a humanitarian worker I'm also a spoken word poet and okay Mrs. Asinat um we're not getting the full gist of the story because it's breaking so uh, we're getting interrupted and we are not hearing you clearly I don't know if uh, there's something you can adjust or would have to come back to you can you hear okay, me so you better Okay, while we are trying to fix that up. Um, okay, so coach, in one minute, something very quick to someone who is thinking that, uh, what is it supposed to reserve? Eh, maybe you had something going for you. Maybe, okay, Mr. Michael is being honest. He, he didn't have much going for him, but maybe for a coach, well, there's something going, going on for her. She would have had back in the family, you know, the kind of thing. What is that one advice you give anyone out there who is feeling like, I am tired, I have tried this, I've tried this, it's not just working. What advice would you give them? One minute. Okay, let me try and do this in one minute. And um, <laughs> this young woman is putting me on a spotlight. We didn't realize this. So. <laughs> okay. So um, I saw Isnet trying to speak and let me just start up with okay. where she stopped from. The truth is, if you've not failed in life, that means you're simply not trying. And some people's story seems more, I don't know, than the other. I Like the response I was seeing in the chat room, everybody is connecting, telling Mr. Michael, thank you. Because you just realized that what you are telling yourself, you are just telling yourself. 
personally, my story is not as interesting as Mr. Michael's story. And I thank God that my story is not as interesting as this story <laughs> because some of those things, I don't know how I would have gone through it. But I, I lost my dad at a very early age. I was 16 when my dad died. My mom was less than 40. I think she was about 38. And I was the first child. And yes, like Essinet, my mom would say that the vision me and your father had, and me, I didn't understand that vision. <laughs> now I understand it in hindsight, and that story for yeah. another day. Is the children must have quality education. The legacy we give our children is quality education. So I ended up going to school with people that were above my league. We're going to one of the best schools in Ilorin Day. And this is the first time I'm saying this openly. You know, teenagers now you want to do shakara. They used to do open day. And I went to school. I'm not kidding. Myself and um, late general idea, one of his kids were at the same school so that you understand the kind of caliber of people I went to school with. So naturally, I developed some form of complex because what you hear in the class is not the reality at home. At home, we had to go and be fetching water on our head and I'll be hiding. No oh God, don't let my classmates see me. I will not leave this down. That's... that's um, how I grew up. We used to have this thing that we call open day, where you're supposed to wear clothes for party. This is the first time I've said this openly now. I never went to one because I did not have the clothes to wear. So I rather go like, I don't do parties with small children. You know, that kind of teenage to me where the other truth is, I do not have the clothes to wear. When they'll be talking in class, my last trip to London, I picked, I said, eh, hey, okay, I reset. We never see money go buy clothes. I'm not, uniform is covering our shame. So yes, we all have our stories. We all started from somewhere. But the truth is, whatever does not break you will make you stronger. And as Essinet said, it's now that I'm appreciating that what those things did in me was develop resilience. Like... If I had gone through this, there are sometimes I'm going through some things. I say, no, we finished from school. I was telling my daughter one day that, see, because my mom, who did, which mouth will you use to go and tell mommy that you need more money? Now, where will she find it from? So if you don't see anybody to carry you from school, you trek back home. But what I do is I pretend as if the trekking is fun. I'm enjoying it. It's because I love to exercise. Till date, walking is still my favorite form of exercise. I can almost drive from here to Lokoja. I'm used to it. <laughs> but yeah, so that is it in two minutes from me. Sorry, you said one minute. Oh, yes. And our <laughs> guest speaker is waiting and ready yes, to go. Yes, it's been an amazing time. Ms. Esnet, I apologize for having to not hear your story, but we are really pressed for time. It's been an amazing time. Thank you to our wonderful panelists for sharing your stories, for inspiring us, and for making us really, really look forward to being better despite all the challenges that we individually face. So this is rounding off this session. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate your presence and your attendance. Thank you very much. Moving over quickly, we're going to the next session. And this session, we have our guests. So please, can we give a warm welcome in the chat box? Our guest has been here from the start. So she's with us. She's, you know, listening to the story. She's, she feels us. And we're very really grateful that she's here as well. Right before she comes up, I'd like to play her profile so we know who is going to be engaging us in the next 30 minutes or so. So uh, here it goes. Give me a few seconds to share my screen and then play the profile. Okay. Here we go. Dr. Yetunde Ayo Uyalowo is a Cartier Women Initiative Fellow 2021 with a career of over 17 years spanning various healthcare administrative management positions. She is the CEO of Market Doctors, a social enterprise poised to change the face of healthcare delivery in Nigeria and Africa at large. She is also a senior partner at Preventive Health Managers, 
a health management consulting firm providing support for employee health and wellness programs for corporate organizations. Both companies are founded by her. Dr. Yetunde has pioneered many health programs, including school health clubs in over 10 schools. She is the convener of Doctors Discuss Malaria, an annual World Malaria Day event that has trained over 1,200 medical doctors on the current management of malaria and best practices in diagnosis and management of malaria for over six years. She has facilitated training for more than 200 medical staff and hospital workers for the Our Spirit of Excellence program for healthcare workers and the Society of Healthcare Quality. She recently executed a USADF United States African Development Foundation project in partnership with Lagos State Employment Trust Fund to provide employability skills to Lagos State youths by training 100 people and more than 60% of them are now fully employed in the health sector. She is also a recipient of many awards, some of which are her Network Woman of the Year Awards Healthcare, Fidelity Bank Most Innovative Business Award, AGPNMS Most Innovative Healthcare Business Award, and lots more. She is happily married with two children. Okay, that is the profile of our amazing guest, and she's here. It's so good to have you on here, Ma. It's a privilege and honor. Like, looking at your profile, I'm like, okay. Okay, okay. I'm in the same room with this amazing woman. Thank you so much for making our time to be with us. Thank you so much. Before you take the floor, I'd like to um, also put it out there that you can drop your questions as she is speaking so that we, we're going to have a question and answer session after she finishes speaking. So we'll just take your questions after that. So going forward, uh, Matt, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Suzanne. Um, I want to say a very big thank you to, to Minino, um, who has been an old, 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 old friend, and it's good to see her now. And the one thing she didn't tell you guys is that she's times two of what she used to be. She was a very slim and tall lady, you know, when we were in school, you know, dark, slim, and, you know, she used to walk like a model and all of that. So I want to thank her especially for bringing me onto this platform. Um, so naturally, you know, I try to convince people that I don't like to, I don't like to be a public speaker, you understand? I don't actually like it, but somehow I get to, um, to talk to people and we have about 39 on this call. I want to say a special shout out to some of my students uh, who I know are on this, on this call, I'm sure you've been seeing a lot of Dr. Yeti, Dr. Yeti, Dr. Yeti, Dr. Yeti. So those are some of my students who I managed to uh, inform about this call. And um, so he's saying thriving at all, against all odds. And really, I decided to just speak from my heart. I want to know how many minutes I have so that I can time myself and I'll know what to mention and what not to mention. You have 30 minutes, Mark. Okay, fantastic. So I'm going to speak from my mind and I'm going to um, let us know that, um, like what Timinindo had mentioned, that if you have not failed, then you've actually not started because whatever your dream is, it's supposed to be bigger, you know, than, than it's supposed to be big, big enough that it scares you and it makes it difficult for you to sleep at night. So I didn't imagine that I was going to be who I am today. I think when I was young, I was coerced into becoming a doctor. You know, in every family, they just like to have a doctor, lawyer, engineer, you know, they just like to scatter the professions, you know, amongst all the different people. So those of you that are the first, you are the ones that they will challenge to do the you know, courses, you know, but I found, um, I find a lot of joy in what I do today because I believe that that is what defines me. And that is what I do at Market Doctors, which means taking healthcare to people in the informal sector, people who cannot actually uh, afford 
healthcare, we try to make it more affordable to them. And in some instances, we try to give them for free. Uh, and so that is what describes me. And I, I have this connect with um, Tumininu because what she's doing is um, something that speaks to someone who has a passion for people who will ordinarily not have access to platforms like this. So, you know, it's not a platform where you see all the big names, all the Instagram celebrities and all of that. But trust me, the things you have had today are just the things you have and you need to take you to where you're going. And uh, so it's never, never easy. And I wrote it when I was posting this on my Instagram page. I wrote that if you want to know the real meaning of packaging this is where you should come to if you want to understand what is called packaging because when people begin to tell you their stories then you will understand that all what you are seeing is packaging you understand that behind that story is a lot of stuff a lot of things that have happened and that will happen but i i will i will start that the first thing that pushes you is your genes what you are made up of some people are made up of genes that make them to struggle. Even when they are billionaires, they are still struggling to have more because their genes are quite pushy. Then the second thing that adds on to it is your environment. So your environment can shape you. Some people cannot suffer. The moment suffering wants to come, they begin to tell themselves that, no, this will not happen to me. And that is what I saw with uh, Mr. McKinney. He told himself, this soft life is what I'm going to get, no matter what it's going to cost. And, you know, and he went for it. So, you know, so the genes, the place of the genes are there and the place of the environment. You understand? The environment is also there. So you look at the two together. Look at what Abdelmininu told us. She told us that the school she went by virtue of the school she went, she knew that she could not fail. She cannot fail. And I dare say today that, you know, as she's a top exec, most of the people in our class, which I'm quite familiar with, are doing very well. It's, you know, is a, a function of the kind of people she moved with. And she said, no, I cannot fail. I will not fail. This is where I'm going. And I'm trusting God that she's not even where she's going yet, that she's just everywhere is still is it the, the sky 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 is just a starting point for her so for you that you are listening to this i want you to tell determine in your mind and ask yourself a question where am i going where do i want to be that is the question you need to ask yourself whether your genes are pushy or your genes are making you sleep 24 hours that is the question you are you need to ask yourself, where am I going? Where do I want to be? Once you have that at the back of your mind, that will push you. That will not make you sleep at night. So I'll tell you a bit of my story. So I grew up in a Lauren like, ah, uh, and you know, parents wanted to do a certain course and that and that. And you know, maybe, maybe to an extent, I had a smooth journey all along. But in my, in my, I said the sky is at beginning. So not that the sky is the office, the sky is the beginning. So it's not a limit, it's the beginning. So when I finished school, I looked at the medicine that I studied and I felt I, I don't want to work in the hospital because you know, there is like a traction, there is like a pathway. Once you become a doctor, then you walk to the office, then you walk in a particular hospital and that is where you walk, walk, walk. And maybe you just retire as a professor and that is a no. I was looking for an expression. And I found that my expression was in people. My expression was in people. I mean, I, I needed people to express myself. And that was shown by my, my, my parents used to say something or my father. They'll say, yes, when they ask friends all across the globe and across different um, dynamics. So I can be friends with the gates man and we'll be close and I'll relate with the gates man at that level. And I can also be friends to the president. And I will relate with the president at that level. So I could do that. So I knew that my expression was in people. And when I was looking for how to express myself in people. And so the first shock that life gave me, the first shock that life, life gave me was that in my last year in medical school, I failed my exams. So you can imagine someone that has done six years in medical school and I was passing and I was moving to the next stage. If you didn't know, I was the head girl in my primary school and I was the head girl in my secondary school. So I was very confident and I felt I knew what I was doing. But you know, at that stage I failed 
And when I failed, you know what you fail in medical school? You do the exam again after three months. When you pass, you go on. If you don't pass that second exam, then you do it again after a year. So when I failed, I felt, oh, I'll pass it in three months and I'll be gone and all of that. But guess what? After three months, I still didn't pass. So I repeated a whole year when I left medical school. And one thing kept kept coming to me at that time. Oh, all my mates have gone, this, that. And everybody I met during that year. And to, till this time, a lot of people don't even know I repeated. You know, there are some people, people just feel that uh, this one cannot repeat. They just think you have gone. Do you understand? So even till now, sometimes when I tell some of my friends, they'll say, ah, you, really, you mean that happened? You know, because people just assume, you know, that you have passed and you have gone. So when that happened and I had to stay a year extra, that one year was what I used to think about myself. I think that was what made me to introspect and think, oh, so this is what happens to people when people don't succeed at doing things. So this is what happens. You know, it made me introspect. And again, I began to feel, oh, all my mates are gone. Will I ever meet them? Oh, they've gone on to do greater things. They've started work and all and all. So I had a lot of mixed feelings. And what did I do that year? I made myself useful. A lot of times when we are going through tough times, we are not useful to ourselves. We just, that is the time people start smoking. That is the time people start drinking. That is the time, you know, girls become wayward. You understand? I made myself useful. And if I told you what I did that time, I'm sure you can never imagine it. During that time, I decided to learn fashion design. So I like going to a tailor's shop to learn. So you can imagine how it is. I went to a far city from where I was living so that nobody would see me. I started learning. So when I was learning tailoring, the, the woman, she would keep on telling me, that you this girl, there's something about you. You're not just a, you're not just an omoshe. You know how they treat omoshe. You sweep the floor, you go and buy food, you do, and I, you know, I was open to it. If they gave me money, I'll go to the market, buy, come back. But she would call me. She would say, there's something about you. You need to tell me. And I'll say nothing. That I'm just there. I just want to learn so that. She didn't know I was a medical student going to end. Until one day, a friend of mine came to make her wedding dress and came to the place. And, you know, she just told because she knew I was much better and advanced than many of the people who were learning together. So she just said, yes, they go and attend to that customer. And guess what? I got to the reception and found the customer was a friend of mine. Tears came to my eyes that day. She was a friend of mine. She was a doctor as well, who finished school the same time I was supposed to have finished and came to make a wedding dress. And I was there to measure her, take her style, help her through the entire smiling. So when I saw her, you know, I was hoping how would she did first recognize me, but you know, later she looked at me and looked at me and screamed. And you know, and that was how my organ knew that this girl is actually a medical student and all of that. So we spoke, I took her measurements, I did everything. And when I got in, I cried, I wasn't myself. But guess what? It prepared me for the hardest moments in life. Because in life, you are going to come to circumstances that you never think that you will get into. You understand? And it's made me resolve that, you know what? When I go back to do my exams, after my exams, when I leave medical school, I'm going to shine. I'm going to soar. This one year is not going to mean, it's not going to define me or define where I will be. So I, you know, I just literally continued like that. And I did my exams, I passed. And that was how I started work. And one scripture that kept me through all of this time, because my parents were Christians and I grew up in a Christian family, was the scripture that said, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. I can do all things. And, you know, in the church I went, we, um, is the apostolic church. And every year you always have this watchword, which you repeat every day, you know. And I think around that time, that was um, one of the watchwords, I can, I can do all things through Christ that strengthened me. And God gave me speed. As I started work, I remember my first job, when I went for the interview, it was like, you are the person I've been waiting for. And I did it for like two years. And by the, the time I was going into the next job, I got a managerial position, which by no means, the person who occupied that position before me was like six years my senior in medical school. In fact, we went to the same medical school. 
So it was like six years my senior. So you can imagine he resigned for the job from the job. And someone that was like six years his junior took over that same job. You know, so God granted me speed, you know. And one thing, and as I started, I because of the feelings I had, the emotions I had when I feel, I was empathic towards people. So when you are going through your odds, there is the, there is, there is the tendency that you, 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 you are no longer human. You feel, oh, this is happening to me. So what's my business? You're not human. You're not kind to the people beside you. You begin to behave anyhow. You don't have any humanity left. To you. No, that is the time to really be human. Use your experience to put yourself in the other person's shoes you know, and be human. And one thing I tell people, especially during this election period, you know, you see a lot of people lose their humanity, you know, or someone lost, someone failed. This is not the time to jeer, to jeer at those that failed. Put yourself in their shoes and offer some comforts. Offer some comforts. Do you understand? So when you're going through this moment, it is the time to put on your humanity. So I move on to when I wanted to start my journey as an entrepreneur. So the journey, driving against all odds, is that you have to come to a point where you empty yourself, empty of yourself of whoever you are. Oh, I have two degrees. I had a degree from the UK. Oh, my father is this. Oh, I'm, you have to empty yourself of all of that and start from the beginning. So what happened when I wanted to go into entrepreneurship? I said, I felt that where I was working at that time did not teach me enough about entrepreneurship. You know, it was a, a medium-sized company. I wanted to work in a big company where I would see the different departments. You know, I would understand how proper companies form. So I decided to take up an internship. When I took up this internship, I had the, my previous job at an official, I had an official car and a driver. So I had to leave my official car and a driver to pick up an internship in a place where they were not ready to pay me. They were not going to pay me anything. And I was supposed to start the internship. So I took it up. So you can imagine that you that you had a car and a driver, people doing things for you. I had a team of about 16 then. And I went on to start my internship in this company. And I put myself into it. I didn't behave like, you know, there's a tendency for you to behave when you're not sick, when they're not paying you to arrive at any time, leave at any time. I was behaving as if they were paying me. And within one month, the HR manager called me and said, you know what, Dr. H, they, I don't, I'm not comfortable not paying you for all the things you do for us. And she crafted something and they began to pay me for month two. When it was six months for my internship to be over, they told me to stay for another six months. And I got, I got a lot of accolades and all of that. But the bottom line is that when I was leaving, that company was the first company to give me a paycheck for my new company. They were the first company to patronize me. And it was a mega patronage. What I'm saying by mega patronage was that my first check was as big as my annual salary in my former company. So when we're talking about, you know, thriving against our odds, it was a time when I was supposed to give up. And I'll mention this. Some people feel that when you're starting, when, you are, when the odds are against you, they say when it rains, it pours. That was not the best time in my life. At that time, it was a time when my husband didn't even have a job. So it was not even a time to leave work. <laughs> Do you understand? It was a time when we we're supposed to be, you know, managing whatever my salary was. But no, that was, you know, when when you when you feel that, when you feel the inkling, and when you when you propose in your heart to give to humanity. Humanity will serve you and they will respond to you. It's not the people that you respond, it's not the people you serve that will respond to you. But God will send people who will respond to you. And one statement I want to make out of this is that once you when you want to set out to do anything, whether in your nine to five job, whether in your entrepreneurship journey, or wherever you find yourself as volunteering, whenever you purpose to serve people, to serve humanity. God will send help to you. Whenever I needed anything during that time, because it was a tough time, entrepreneurship, you don't know when the next check was going to come from, God always provided. 
just when you are at the brink, God always provided. So even at your nine to five, be human. When I mean be human, be human to drivers, be human to the woman that sweeps, be human to people around you. Don't sit on your high horse, oh, I'm the boss, I'm this, I'm that. Be human to everybody that you meet. When you are human to them, God will repay you that humanity. He would repay you by people you do not know. And my, my journey to entrepreneurship started like that. Most of the people that began to patronize, that began to give my company jobs, were people I had known in my previous jobs. Because during my previous job, I worked like all my life dependent, depended on it. And this is another um, thing I want you to note. When you're at work, even if it's a one-man company, because I know a lot of people, we are so quick to downplay what we have. Oh, my job, oh, they're just paying me 15000 I'm just managing it, so I'm ready to move. Some people, six years, they're still at that job. Do you understand? Whatever the job is, whatever is paying you, do it as if you are doing it unto God, not unto that person. And guess what? That work you're doing, you're actually doing it for yourself. You're not doing it for the company. Take it that you're doing it for yourself, you're doing it for God. Because I found that for the places that I've worked, all the works I did for the company or for the people at that time, those were the relationships, those were the contacts, those were the people I had to fall back on, you know, when I started my own enterprise. And I remember people used to tell me when I was doing that, um, when I was doing that, um, that job, some people would tell me, yet today, you know, this product you have come to, because I was head of marketing, and they'll say, this product that you have come to sell to us, we don't need it, but I'm going to buy it because of you. They'll tell me that. We don't need it, but I'm just going to buy it because of you. I'll have some other people say, you know what? This product you are selling, I don't need it and I won't buy it. But when you have a product, you can bring it to me. Or if you have anything you feel you can can do for the company and I'll pay you as the side of to bring the proposal and I'll do it for you. You know, so for whatever job you are doing, do the job 100%. Forget about how much you are being paid. Do it 100% because your reward is coming. The reward is not from that job. Your reward is coming. Your reward from humanity is coming. If there is any business, no matter what the business is, it's once the business is thriving, it means the business is serving humanity. If it's a telecom company, thriving because people need to talk to each other. Whatever place you work, as long as the business, you have a few customers that is serving humanity, do the best that you can do there. Then when you come into um, entrepreneurship, there's a lot of issues, funding, financing, staff issues, and all of even regulatory issues, because sometimes you know you have to register with the government and all of that. There are all of that. But like I said, what Philippians 4:13 says that I can do all things to, through Christ that strengthens me. Even if you're a Muslim, you can do all things. That's the bold word there. I can do all things. You know, once it's with you, then you are bigger and whatever circumstance is coming towards you. And there are four things you should hold on to, which I think I'll be rounding up now so that I can take questions. I can't talk, possibly talk about everything, but I'll, 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 I'll be rounding up. Them. Four things you should have in your mind is opportunity recognition. Opportunity recognition. Whether you are working nine to five or you are doing your business or you want to start a side hustle, you need to be able to recognize opportunities. And how to recognize opportunities, like I said, is serve humanity. When you serve humanity, you will find out what are the problems of humanity. Humanity has a lot of problems and decide to solve it. So find the opportunity. So for anything that is happening, there must be something, an opportunity in it for you. So find the problem and recognize the opportunity. Once you recognize the opportunity, decide to do what you want to do now never think that people are doing people are doing stuff oh i want to start selling drinks ah, people, everybody is doing it i should not start no the sky is big enough for all of us the sky is big enough for all of us and like i said when you are serving humanity you will begin to find out how you are going to do yours 
and that will to be your unique selling point. So the first thing is opportunity recognition. The second thing is comfort with risk. You must be comfortable with risk. Most of the time, people don't want to, don't want to go through any risk. So you have a job, you're not enjoying the job, or you're not, at the end of the month, you don't make anything from the job. But guess what? You are still taking the job because you don't want to become jobless. Because becoming jobless is a risk. So for you to, for you to thrive, you need to be comfortable with risk. So when there is a risk, when there is, is when there is a risk, that is when there is big opportunity. So you, you're not going to make money at some point. So when you are at home 24 hours and you're not making money, your brain will start working. I remember when I first started in my office, you know, I would not have any job. And one of my mentors that used to have offices beside me, he would tell me, yeah, today, you must come to work every day, even if there is no work. So I come to work and I sit at my desk. Then I took a cloud, a, a chair, and I put it in my in my office. And, you know, and I used to sleep on that um, chair when I'm tired. But guess what? It was during those times I began to find, okay, I can do school health club. Okay, I can do this program. Okay, I can do that. So you understand? So you have to be comfortable with risk. So I didn't have any money. So not having any money in my pocket made me think and design new products, you know, that I could use. So you need to be comfortable with risk. It's not going to be, it's not going to be rosy all the time. And comfortable with risk you also need to have a savings habit when there when you are hundred thousand forget about all the things we see on social media and i must live my life i must that do my life all of, most of the people doing that already have something saved up you understand so you must have that so there's something to fall fall back to even though it won't be as good as it was before but there's something down and that's what will make you comfortable with risk you know, so the next thing you must have is creativity. Creativity. Some people say, I can never think of, I don't think God has given anybody, 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 um, no idea at all. I'm sorry, I have to keep on referring to the Bible, but if you know the story of the talent, that story of the of that that talent, that parable of the talent, why he told us of the person that was given one talent, why he told us of the person that was given one talent is because one talent is enough for you to succeed in life. If you can just do one thing, it's enough for you. So you don't have to be able to do many. So God gave some people 10, some God gave some people five, some people have so much, you understand? So, but what he's saying is that one talent is enough. So if it's just one thing that you know how to do, it's enough to make you blow. It's enough to make you explode. You understand? So if you want to thrive against all odds, nobody is going to serve it to you a la carte. You are going to have to recognize the opportunities. You are going to have to be comfortable with risk and you have to be creative. You have to be creative. So one, if you are not just one, have to do one thing, just one talent I can cook is enough to make you. Oh, just one talent I can talk is enough. Just one talent, I can make clothes, is enough. Just one talent, I can clean a place, is enough. Just one talent, I can write, is enough. Do you understand? So there must be that one thing. I can do makeup. I must, it's enough. Just one talent. And I know a lot of us, God gave us much, much, much more than one. Then the last one is collaboration. Collaboration. So, some people say, I don't have friends. I don't have friends. Why? Or I don't know anybody. And that is a very common thing. And I'll use my, my last story to buttress the point of I don't know anybody. So I grew up in Elorne, like to me, you know, and Elorne is a small city. Everybody's comfortable. You know, you, in, in, when we were growing up, we didn't grow up in mansions. We grew up in situations where when your parents want to build a house, once they build it, once they finish building it, they don't have to paint it for you to move in. That's how it was there. People were comfortable. There was no um, hyper rich. 
You understand? Everybody, you are just on your lane, going to church, going to school. And I can tell you, we had the best of education, the best of friendships and all of that in that little town. So coming to, coming to Lagos, you know, you come into Lagos, I'm sure those of you, if you come into Lagos, if you drive in Lagos, you see the kind of cars you'll be seeing, you'll start wondering, am I going to, <laughs> am I ever going to be able to drive any of these cars, no matter how long I stay in this Lagos? Because I came to Lagos after getting married, you know? And, you know, you, you, you don't begin to, or you go to, someone invites you to a big office, you enter the office, everything is buckling. The girls are coming up, everybody has a nice shape with short skirt, suits, long hair, and everybody's doing co, 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 and you're saying, hey, am I going to survive? Is this going to happen? When God, where are you? Do you, do you understand? Even for the guys, you come in to Lagos, you see guys, the day they're arriving, they already have a job, you know, and in those, in our own days, the main job was banking. Everybody was a banker. We're getting jobs. And right now, people are getting tech jobs. So someone says, oh, I work remotely, I earn in dollars, and you know, people are talking, oh, I have three jobs and one side or so. I work for, both for a company in the U.S. I do a lot of things for Amazon. You know, people can drop names for you and you're saying, hey, yeah, when is this going to happen to me? You know, what I can tell you, what I can tell you is that collaboration is what will get you in, for, in front of kings. So when I started my company, a decision I decided to make, I changed my church. I don't want to go into the nitty gritty of why I changed my church, but I just felt at that point, I needed to, I just needed to change my environment. So I changed my church. When I got to my new church, there was a training going on, you know, all these entrepreneurship trainings. And you know what, even many of us, when we hear about entrepreneurship training, we'll be thinking it's for people that want to do makeup. It's for people that want to set up all these small, small businesses. And you know, and we won't go, you know, and we won't go. So I, I most of the time we'll say, oh, it's for people that want to set up and we won't go. But I went for that training. Even though at that time I already had a company, I was earning six figures at that time. But because I decided this was a time to calm down, this was a time to, you know, rewire. I went for that training. And at the end of the training, like I told you, it was a mixed multitude. At the end of the training, I didn't even know that I came top or whatever it was. We did the training for like four weeks and it was over and I continued my business. And the church at that point gave us 500,000, a money that we were going to pay back after one year to start whatever business we wanted to start. At that time, I didn't even know that kind of thing was available in the world, you know? And they gave us, and that was the money I used to start Market Doctors. That was the money, 500,000 that the church borrowed me at that time, it was the money I used to go and rent a shop in the market that I turned to a mini clinic to start Market Doctors. Fast forward to about a year later, someone, Someone came to the church and said, I want to mentor someone who has a small business. And the church felt, who are we going to give this guy? Because it was a big business guru. And they said, oh, call Dr. Yetunde. She was very good at the training and all of that. And they gave me a letter. They told me to go and meet this, um, this man that was going to be my new mentor. You know, when I got there, I was shocked. You know, there are some names you'll be hearing. You'll be seeing it in newspaper. You'll be seeing it on billboard. You'll be seeing it in network news, but you'll be thinking you can never meet them. And that was the person I was given as a mentor. And fast forward from this guy, then my former boss called me and said, today, someone wants to invest in a company in Nigeria and is looking for who to invest in. And I felt, looking around, I felt you are the only person who he can invest in. Listen, my former boss had left that company. Had left. So the person had a choice of saying, I don't know anybody. You understand? The person had a choice to say that. But because of the impact, the footprints that had left, the person connected me to them. And these people came together, four people came together to become angel investors into my business. And they put down at that time, almost 50 million naira for me to start the company. 
Till today, they have not checked my account. They, some of them don't even know where my office is. At the end of the year, we pay dividends, you know, I run the accounts I do it, but based on that trust and the company is moving forward, you know, and we are running to a verge of almost making a million dollars. You understand? So all these ingredients that I've listed for you are things that will make you thrive against all odds. Let me tell you, you will always be in a odd, in odd. Don't, nobody has arrived. There, is, there will always be something that will put you in oddity. You will always be in that position that you will have to thrive, that you will have to be resilient. You understand? And you must be prepared for it. I remember during COVID, for the entire COVID period, we did not do one business. Not one. But guess what? The resilience we had built, we were able to pay our salaries throughout COVID, and the company was able to move on you know, after COVID. So thriving during odds, we will always be in one form of odd or the other because the Bible has said it, as long as we are in this world, if the oddity is not at work, it will be in family. If it's not in family, it will be in sibling. If it's not in sibling, it will be in friend. If it's not in friend, it will be in your estate association. There are so many things that will bring the oddity. But, you know, we can thrive. We can thrive, we can swear, and we can rise. We can rise above whatever life throws to us. Remember, like I said, Philippians 4.13, we can do all things through Christ that strengthens us. Thank you. Where is Susan? Did she drop off? <laughs> wow, wow, woo, hey, hey. As in, there's this thing, Dr. Etende, God bless you. Ah, yes, here today said I used to be very slim. At least I've told you a little pinch of my story. When you have a widowed woman raising four children, <laughs> they will be fashionable by force. I used to think I couldn't grow fat until I started eating good food. Now I understand what it means to diet. Amazing amazing, where is Susan? Amazing, amazing, amazing story. One thing I want to leave with us, like the story is just amazing. Yes, I'm seeing the amazing in the chat. Alongside with the panelists is this year, 2023, I've been telling the Reed family, don't be the weapon that is fashioned against yourself that will not make yourself prosper. A lot of times we are looking at external force. There, there was a presentation I had to do that. There is the enemy called you. You know, you think it is um, the second wife, my uncle, my sister, village people. This year, don't be that village person that would not make yourself prosper. Thank you, amazing story. You know, sometimes we are too arrogant. Pride, you need to bring down your shoulders. She could have said, I'm a doctor. What do I need to do here? That was the starting point for, so to say, a turnaround. She went for something that did not look at like it. They will invite you for programs. You will refuse to go to the program. And that's why it looks like I'm a Christian, yes, and you can see it. I'm against religion because I see it. Notice two different things. So, uh -huh. so when I say I'm against religion, we are so religious, we are not moving. Because everything we need to do, I personally believe is in our hands. She could have sat down and be praying, oh God, send me my helper of destiny, 50 million. But there are practical steps that bring in those things. Please, more than the wawawu, I said it last time, I know me, I don't bend mouth to talk. It's not about you sounding like siren. It's about you taking definite actions. Which program will I go to? In my place of work, I'm volunteering, you heard her, as I am volunteering in this place, I'm going to be my best self. It's, these things are really practical. It's, it's not just motivation and motivation will only take you so far, but practical application is where the difference is. Um, I think Susan, 
is back. Excellent. We are going to the questions and answers. If you want to speak, please raise your hand. If you have, remember it's practical questions. If we think, because we are streaming live. So Dr. Eastender, it's not just the people you are seeing in the room. The Facebook family, <laughs> they are there. And we're over 2,000 yeah. on the Facebook <laughs> community and it's equally going to be on YouTube. So this goes viral. We've had um, about a thousand views on some of our videos. So it really goes very viral and the internet never forgets. There's the feedback form in the chat group. If you have a question you want to speak, please raise your hand or you can drop your practical questions in the chat room. This is part of the way to grow in 2023. Susan is back. SNET has been able to revive our network. So she really wants to answer the question. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. Uh, can you meet yourself, SNET, so you can, while we're dropping questions or raising our hands for questions. Mrs. SNET, uh, the question on failure, how you're able to handle failure, a practical story, and how you're able to turn that event or around and well, make it successful. So you can go ahead now. Okay, the first thing, I'm, a, I'm glad to be back. <laughs> um, so the first thing that I, I will say is, okay, can you hear me? Just to be clear that you can hear me, you can see me, it's better than the last time. Yeah, I can hear you. I, I can't see you though, but I can hear you. Okay, okay. So yeah, I can see you now, perfect. So go ahead. Okay. So for me, the first, the, the first thing I've noticed when it comes to failure is as human beings, we always want to see ourselves as perfect. What helped me was admitting when I failed because it's, it's pride sometimes won't want us to admit that to ourselves that, okay, I have failed in this, in this instance. And for me, the minute I'm able to admit that I have failed, that's the next step for me to move up and just scale and be better. So I'm a spoken word poet. And when I initially started, I started then with my husband. We were still courting ourselves. He was my friend and he was really good at spoken word as well. So what I would do is I, would, I was very good at poetry. And like I initially had said, my mom invested in me reading. You cannot take out the people that invest in you. So my mom was at the core of who I am now as a speaker. And I remember the first time I wrote my first poem, she looked at it, she encouraged me, this is beautiful. And I would do it, you know, I just tried in school and all of those things. But the first time I would perform, I was always using a book. So I would read out these beautiful poems, these inspiring poems that are, you know, my poetry is against, you know, gender-based violence, trying to advocate for, equal opportunities and just around social issues. But as I'm reading, I'm losing my audience. And I remember I went to, there's a museum here in Abuja where I performed. And to be honest with myself, I could have done better. So I go there and I read this amazing poem and I'm satisfied, but I just had a few people kind of clap and I wasn't sure of myself. The next poet that came on, she was outstanding. She was confident. She didn't have any paper with her. She just went there. And before she had finished, she had the, the crowd, you know, standing up. She had a standing ovation. It was amazing. And I knew in that moment that I had not put my best foot forward. I had become comfortable in this particular space. And I felt I wanted to be the best, but I was not doing what I needed to do to be the best. So when there was a particular, there were honorables that were around and they wanted, the, they wanted to pick a particular um, poet. And between the two of us, you know, they were pointing in, a, in one direction. So I thought they initially wanted to pick me. So I stood up and I went there. They were like, no, 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 it's not you. They picked the other person. I felt shattered. I felt like I didn't even want to do poetry again. And I went back home and I was crying. And again, the important people in your life that are there to encourage you. You cannot negate those people. And that person for me was my sister. And she encouraged me. She was like, yes, look, you can do this if you work at it. And from that point, I continued to work on, I continued to practice. 
the first, the next time I tried again, this time it was with my husband. Like I said, he was my friend and we were on stage together. I made a mistake. I tried, I went there without my book. I made a mistake. The only thing that saved that performance was the fact that my husband learned both his lines <laughs> and my lines at the time. I felt bad. I knew I had failed, but I knew I could do better. Yeah. And I went back to the drawing board. And if I knew I had a performance, three weeks time, I would start learning it immediately. And I put everything. I went online to see how people were doing it. I surrounded myself. I asked questions. I put, you know, I just kept doing it. I would look in the mirror. I would practice it over and over again. I would see myself performing without, without a book. And I remember I went, I had an opportunity to go straight on that stage again. It came again. And I told myself this time, they are going to feel that there's a different SNET that is on stage. And I perfected my lines. I perfected my story. I perfected my poetry. I had done the work I had to do. And I went there with the mentality like, I must get this. I must wow the crowd. If not for anyone else, but for myself first and foremost. And when I went on that stage, I did well. I excelled and the opportunities that came from there, I'm still benefiting from them today. So failure is inevitable at times, but your mindset towards failure is what is going to take you from either hardening and pushing back or from getting up once again and trying consistently, consistently to be better. Am I the best boy then? No, I'm not. But this principle, is what is pushing me to be better. So yes, you fail, but accept it. That's the most important lesson. Be able to be honest with yourself and say, you know what? I failed and I can do better. So yes. Wow. That's, that's <laughs> my short story on. Yeah, on really inspiring. And thank you so much, Mrs. Essenet. That was really inspiring. It made me feel better. I, I remember, I think that was, um, Wednesday, I, I sing and just leading worship that day, there were a lot of mistakes. It was so bad. I got home and I cried like hell. I was like, Jesus never happened. Like, how did this happen? But it happened. And the thing is, I have to, first of all, okay, where are the areas I need to work on? And how do I do better? And that's what we're learning here today. So we're going straight into questions and answers session and I'm seeing just one question. I don't know this, if this is just on my part, but that's what I'm seeing here. And no hand is raised yet. So I would go to my question first and then I'd, I'd put the question here. So um, Dr. Yetunde, this is to you first, or not to you. Um, so we're talking about driving against all odds, um, handling circumstances that are beyond our making or you know, what we can fix at a time but then comes the emotion the um so if personally if i feel at like something first of all i am consumed with so much disappointment like how can i possibly have gotten this wrong or done this and at some point it's almost like it's going to weigh me down so much that i do not even want to try it again so what is your advice